Good evening. I'm Mike Perry. I'm the president of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The foundation is the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center, a component of the Army War College, and the Army's premier research facility on the history and heritage of the U.S. Army. Tonight, we're pleased to have Colonel Retired Dave Porter, who served 27 years as a combat arms officer. His service began in Vietnam, and during the Cold War, he served multiple tours on the interzonal border between East and West Germany. His border service culminated with the commander of the 3rd Infantry Division's Cavalry Squadron, the 3rd Battalion, 4th Cavalry Regiment in Schweinfurt, Germany, during the turbulent days of 1989 and 1990, when the wall between East and West Germany collapsed. They've also served tours in other combat divisions, in the Training and Doctrine Command, or TRADOC, and various staff positions, including on the Department of the Army staff. Prior to retirement, uh, Dave commanded the 2nd Brigade Reserve Officer Training Corps, or ROTC, 4th Army ROTC Region. Upon retirement, he became Director of Admissions at Colorado Technical University, and five years later began a 20 plus year career as a government contractor. Dave and his wife, Susie, of over 54 years reside in Jacksonville, Tennessee. Dave, we're pleased to have you on board tonight and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks, Michael. That's Jackson, Tennessee, not Jacksonville. Small. Jacksonville, excuse me, yes. Yes, yeah, I hear it for you. how to read. Right. Uh, thank you, Michael, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm really proud to be here. And uh, before I begin, I wanna thank a couple of people. First of them is Mike. First person is Mike, as he says, he's the president and CEO of all this, of the foundation. And he invited me and he was very helpful to me and he helped me get these digits together. And uh, so thanks, Mike. Uh, the second person is Amanda Neal, who's the operations officer of the foundation and who also was very, very helpful to me in, in uh, arranging all this. When, if you go to the foundation's website, when you go to the foundation's website, there's a sentence in there that really grabbed my attention. It's in the first in several pictures. And, and the sentence is, and I quote, help preserve soldiers' memories and educate future generations. That's a, that's a powerful uh, uh, charter statement, and I'm so glad to be a part of that. I believe in that uh, with all my soul, and we, we always, we, we need to talk about uh, what went on in the past before the past is outside our reach. So my book, this evening I'm going to talk about parts of my book. 52 years ago, I was a scout pilot in, uh, in the uh, Air Cavalry Troop, the, uh, the scout platoon of the Air Cavalry Troop. I was a section leader uh, of the 11th Cavalry in, uh, in uh, Vietnam. We were stationed near Cambodia at a place called Quan Loi. Our mission was to find the enemy. The tactics we used in conducting the mission was called Hunter Killer. And that's a lot about what I'm gonna talk about this evening. Uh, this, I'm going to quickly go through some introductory slides that will lay the foundation for what's going to follow. I think I'm going to talk about four different uh, uh, excerpts from my book where I thought would be appropriate, including the last fight I was in, which took place at a place called uh, that became known as uh, Valley of the Shadows. Next slide, Mike. That's me. I'm uh, from Gallup Police, Ohio. 2,700 happy Buckeyes uh, on the Ohio River in Southeast Ohio. Had a great childhood. Mom and dad were great. Had a superb brother. Went to school, South Dakota State University. I was in the Army ROTC program there and, uh, and subsequently the flight program, which led me to, uh, to uh, where I am to, to uh, Vietnam eventually. Next slide, Mike. Uh, some terms I'm going to use as we go through this. First, Indian country. Indian country was the area outside the wire, outside the wire in which we lived. It was where the VC mucked around uh, in bands of two to 30, and the Indian country was very well named. Visual reconnaissance, uh, same as a hunter-killer uh, mission. It's, it was a four by four kilometer box that we were assigned to look into for VC or evidence of VC. Devil's Snare was a vicious uh, helicopter ambush built around a 51 caliber machine gun, always killed our guys. There was always death associated with the Devil's Snare. We stayed away from it as much as possible. Oscar 
Oscar were the uh, were the enlisted 19 Delta uh, junior NCO scouts who sat the left side of us. Extraordinary human beings, every one of them. Uh, just great, uh, great people and great trainers, and they helped young guys like me figure out what was going on. Oscars, and then last dead man zone. Someone calculated that uh, the max effective range of the AK-47 was 1,300 feet. Feet. So we flew at 1,500 feet. Stay out of that, uh, out of range of the AK-47, and. Uh, that was 1,500 feet to ground level was uh, dead man zone. Next slide. Uh, Vietnam uh, on the left, you can see the whole country is surrounded by uh, Cambodia, Laos, and then North Vietnam in the north. To the right, the smaller picture inside the yellow bubble is where I was specifically. You see Quan Loi in, in the dead center there. A little bit north of that's Lok Nin. Lok Nin, we call the capital of. Indian country because it, it, a lot of fighting took place there. It had a little tiny uh, uncontrolled airstrip. And then north of Loch Ninh, you, you can see the border. So you can see within about 20 kilometers there is where we were in, that, uh, in relation to the border. Next, please. Uh, Quan Loi military uh, complex. This is where we lived. Interestingly here, you, you can see the trees. Those are rubber trees. We lived in the uh, lived in a rubber plantation, believe it or not. Uh, and and of course the structures here were relatively relative luxury compared to the way our brown brothers lived out in the bush. Next slide, please. Uh, our enemy were two. We called them dinks in both cases. Dinks, uh, the Viet Cong, not well trained, not well equipped. But they knew the land. They were supported by the by the folks all around us, and they were they would kill Americans where they found them. Next slide. The NVA, the professionals from the north. They came from the north, trained in the north, came to the north as as a unit, uh, very well equipped, well trained, and uh, serious uh, serious soldiers. Next, please. <coughs> Our weapons uh, that, we, that, that we faced, uh, the AK-47, we all know about that. Uh, the 51 caliber I mentioned briefly, Dushka is what we called it. That means, interestingly enough, in Soviet, dear mother, isn't that something? So uh, dear mother was uh, a vicious, vicious weapon. As I said, it always meant death to us, and we stayed away from it as much as possible. The other weapon was the, it was the 122 Katusk uh, Ross rocket, occasionally it would land in Kuala Lumpur. Not enough to talk about that. Next, please. The terrain was was uh, very diverse. Uh, you can see there there were there were plains, there were uh, uh, rice paddies. That's a little marshy, and then there were some flatlands, some drylands, and of course, always the jungle was not triple canopy uh, thick jungle, but still. Uh, Pretty significant, particularly around the border. Next, please. Speaking of the border, uh, I anointed the border as key terrain, and here's why. The primary terrain feature in Indian country was the two to 3,000 meter strip of earth, which paralleled the Cambodian border between South Vietnam and Cambodia, roughly 25 kilometers from Quan Loi. The strip was the scene of the most absolute devastation I had ever seen, pockmarked and mangled terrain Huge uprooted and twisted trees with exposed roots, gigantic craters everywhere, old ones full of brackish water with green scum on top, the newer ones two to three stories deep, some still smoldering from recent Air Force bombing or Army artillery. There was nowhere else in our AO remotely like the border. Most ominous, most ominous was the uneasy and disquieting sense that you may be under observation by dinks from Cambodia and at any second, hostile fire could erupt and we could be attacked. The border represented many things to us. The frustration from being, being unable to track VC beyond the border was the foremost. That frustration was a continual and ongoing burr under the saddles of the cavalrymen of the Air Cavalry Troop. Next slide, please. The regiment, I was in the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, as I said, extraordinary unit, extraordinary leadership from top to bottom. Uh, 
the regiment had three, correction, four fighting uh, combat arms uh, elements, three cavalry squadrons who were out uh, in Indian country, always moving, always looking for fights. Um, the, the, the old saying, the sun never sets on a cavalry squadron talk, I think originated there and it was true. And I think that was that movement, eternal movement was uh, a big part of the successes they had. The second, the correction, the, the fourth uh, combat arms element was the air cab troop, which is what I was in. And we called, we had a great call sign. We were called Thunder Horse, Thunder Horse. I like that. Next, please. I'll talk about two platoons in the uh, air cavalry troop. First, the attack platoon, Cobra, AH-1G Cobra. You can read the mission. Uh, this was a very unusually, it was, it was an extraordinary uh, weapon system for what we were doing in hunter killer work. Uh, two pilots, one sat in the back, one sat in the front, tandem. And it was, uh, they were exceptional pilots. Next slide, please. Scout platoon, which is what uh, where I spent a lot of time and what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, very powerful, little, very small aircraft, as you can see. 252 shaft horsepower. Um, very, very strong. And as I said, very fast. Needed to be both of those. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the minigun. It's called the M134 minigun. Fired 2,000 or 4,000 round a minute. Uh, GE... Uh, motor drove that thing and it would really spit out some fire. Pilot controlled that. On the left hand side you see the M60 machine gun hanging out the, out the door frame and that was uh, where the observer sat, the Oscar sat, and that was his weapon. Next slide please. The enemy situation and it was about the same for the whole time I was there with the exception of 1 May when we went into Cambodia. And the situation was this, uh, we, were, we were fronted by the 9th ninth, uh, ninth Division and the divisions, the NVA divisions came out of, the, out of the north into the south, mucked around in the south for about three years and then came out. That was sort of a routine they did. And again, 9th Infantry Division was, we were between them and the border. And it was uh, often thought that, uh, that was because the, the vicious fighting that we got involved in was because of that. We were preventing them from going home. And uh, it was, uh, again, it was pretty vicious fighting uh, in that area. And that's about the way it was the whole time I was there. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanna briefly talk about hunter killer operations just so you understand the way we did it. Um, two part mission, find and fix the enemy. B, secondly, develop the situation. That's the fun part. We did that uh, once we found them by firing artillery on them, or in some cases there were ground troops in the area and they would come and clean up, but that was, uh, that was the developed situation piece. Next. Two aircraft involved in this. First, the Cobra. He flew at 1,500 feet above the, the loach down in the box, in the VR box. Uh, the pilot uh, flew the aircraft, communicated with the ground, and monitored what was going on with the scout. The co-pilot in the front seat was in, interested in one thing, and that was the health and the welfare of that scout below him. He did that uh, via the right-hand picture, has a picture, has a picture of the sights that he had. In the middle of that site was a, an IR, a white, a very white, light, it was kind of a pipper, we call it a pipper. And when he put that on the scout, the guns and the turrets slewed automatically to where that scout was flying. And so if something should happen, co-pilot pulls those triggers and uh, immediately rounds start uh, impacting around the scout and hopefully protecting him. Next slide, please. So we've got the Cobra up top. Next is the scout down low, flying as it says, as I say, nap of the earth continually communicating observations through the Cobra above. And the observer sitting in the left seat does the same thing. He would talk to me, I would talk to the pilot, and we would pass information that way as to what we were seeing. The, the guidance we got, which is the center picture, look for anything out of place, was genius. That's, that was uh, superb guidance. We needed that, and that's what we went by. Look for anything out of place. Next slide, please. 
So we've got the two, we have the cobra and we have the scout down low. We call this thing the dance. Whenever, uh, whenever, whenever anyone was attacked, the dance with the dreaded dink, several things happened almost immediately. First, the mark, which was that M18 smoke grenade that would be kicked out by the observer off the top of his gun and was wired to his gun and it would fall to the ground and, and identify as closely as possible where the dinks were, the mark. Next thing that would happen, so correct, almost simultaneously, the pilot, me, I would say, taking fire. And I would return fire and, and also almost immediately the Cobra would begin his gun run. Purpose of the gun run was to sub subdue the fires that I was uh, 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 receiving. So those things happened almost at once. It was almost like a dance. It was extraordinarily uh, well choreographed and it, it just worked very, very well, the dance. Next, please. Combat multipliers we had for these, for the dance, if you will, were two. Fires were extraordinary. They, were, they never failed. They were extraordinarily accurate. They could take a, a fire mission from an idiot like me and convert it into a mission. And they just, they were just terrific troops the whole time I was there. The other combat multiplier, the guy in the middle, the fact, the forward air controller, the Air Force, believe it or not. This guy cruised around in our battle space in that aircraft, monitoring our radios. And I thought of him as a, a playground bully looking for trouble. And when he found it, he, when he heard something on our net that would interest him, he would call us and say, can I help you? And we always said, yes. And we would get out of the way and he would terminate the contact. Yeah, they were extraordinary in that regard and uh, uh, great people to work with. Next, please. So I'd been in the uh, troop about, about uh, three months. I was a lift pilot in the scout platoon or correction in the in the lift platoon, uh, and and it's a good place. That was a good place to learn what I was doing, learn radios, learn terrain, learn people, learn maintenance, all that. But I uh, I knew guys in the scout platoon. I liked what they were doing. I I liked their mission. I particularly liked the fact they thought about what they were doing. They they created these this list called rules of engagement. And that came from uh, evening talks. They called them bog sats, bunch of guys sitting around talking. They'd have bog sats and talk about how the day went, uh, what, what should we change. They were early AARs, preliminary AARs. The, the most important of the rules of engagement was number seven. And it's a scout's word is his bond. We felt extraordinarily uh, pulled by this, by this particular rule of engagement. We knew that life and death mission or life and death uh, decisions were being made on what, on, on what we were reporting. So we were ex extremely careful about uh, what we reported. Scouts worded as bond. Next, please. So I had, uh, I was in the scout platoon and um, there were throughout Vietnam, scout pilots who were who had terrific reputations as, as just real heroes. We had one in our troop and I'd heard about him before uh, and, and he's one of the characters that I want to talk about, the only character I'll talk about tonight. There, there were several in the in the troop, but this is uh, this is a man I, I named Gunfighter and I called it uh, Thunder Horse's Celebrity. Throughout Vietnam, there were scout pilots who had become living legends because of their exploits as scouts. There was one of those celebrities in our troop. I called him Gunfighter. Gunfighter was a heavily decorated first lieutenant, graduate of the University of Virginia, uh, who had been in Vietnam nine months when I first met him. He was a slight man, aloof, a little prickly, moody, very bright, and I thought unusually driven. His, his bunk was at the end, uh, far end of the scout hooch by the exit door. On off days, he usually stayed in his AO, AO and read. However, when gunfighter flew hunter-killer missions, he nearly always found VC, an invaluable attribute and the standard in the scout business. Gunfighter flew almost exclusively with an exceptional 
a Hawaiian Oscar named Pineapple. And often the gun platoon leader, Red Six, was his gun pilot. That was unquestionably a powerful hunter-killer team. Gunfighter would often return from missions with AK-47 holes in his OH-6. Bamboo shoots on telephone wires draped on his loach skids from his aggressive line. I worked hard at getting to know him. He was good and I wanted to learn from him. One evening I pressed him on why take the chances he did. He waved a finger slowly in my direction and said, wait till the first time you get shot at, then you will know. Later, during phase two scout training, I asked him if I could fly a mission with him as his Oscar. He reluctantly agreed. We flew a short one and a half hour mission. We found very little VC activity. I think he blamed me for that. However, I did note during that flight, I thought he did fly aggressively compared with other scouts I'd flown with, but also very shrewdly. He used terrain better than any scout I'd ever seen. At the end of the empty head mission, we refueled, hovered back to the revetment, and he shut the OH-6 down. As we were sitting in the confined OH-6 uh, uh, compartment, the rotors were slowing down overhead. He looked at me oddly, tilted his head, and gave me the only advice he ever spoke. Porter, you know the Marx theory of inevitability. I did not. I looked it up later. It has to do with the uh, inevitable forces in the market, uh, but I didn't know it then. Anyhow, I have a theory about scouting, he went on. I call it the scouting theory of inevitability. I concluded a long time ago that if you get really good at this, you're going to get hurt. It is inevitable. His theory was not particularly uplifting to an aspiring scout and was frankly troubling. After watching his techniques for finding dinks, Gunfighter was really different in only one respect from the other scout pilots with whom I had flown. All scouts use similar procedures for finding VC. Follow trails, look for evidence of recent activity, look for anything out of place, discover recent bunkers, and in order to find these signs required a certain amount of skill, which came with experience. Often those procedures led to a dead end. Gunfighter did not accept the dead end ever and was often willing to take one more step, which jeopardized both himself and his Oscar. That was the difference between he and other pilots. My first fight, I had been, uh, I, this was my third mission, and I was, obviously I was, I was new at what I was doing. And I was flying with, uh, next slide please, uh, Mike. I was flying with uh, the Cobra platoon leader, Red Six. After about 30 minutes of finding nothing, Red Six repositioned me to another area about a kilometer north. While repositioning, I flew low level along an ox cart path in route to the new position, very similar to the path in front of us. As I crested a small hill, startlingly there in front of us on the dusty path were three BC, casually strolling north. Same direction I was flying. The three were naked to the waist and had their AKs loosely slung across their shoulders. As we approached them from behind, they turned and saw us and lurched off the path. They got barely into the edge of the elephant grass when they were stopped in their tracks by Oscars firing his M60 in front of them. They stood up, their arms raised to the sky, and their weapons fell to the ground in the grass in front of them. I hovered about 30 feet to their front and reported over the radio to Red Six. Kill them, kill them, what's wrong with you? Kill them now. I didn't want to kill them and saw no reason to do it. After some back and forth on the radio, Red Six called Third Squadron and told them, we have three prisoners. They were delighted and responded that four armored vehicles would be at our location in 10 minutes. I kept hovering the loads directly in front of the BC who stood rigidly as before with their hands in the air. This was my first chance to look more closely at them. The wake from my rotor blades was kicking up dust, their long hair was blowing, and they were leaning into the OH-6 wake. Oscar had his M60 trained on them. I'm sure they could see that. I noticed they looked very young. Suddenly something, probably a brief gust of wind, 
twisted my loach a bit to the left, and for a millisecond, we could not see the young VC. During that instant, they recovered their weapons and standing bolt upright in the elephant grass, all three began firing at us. I instinctively pulled the trigger and the minigun roared as I pushed the right pedal. The pedal pressure swung the gun back quickly back to the right, spewing rounds that kicked up dirt all around and behind the VC. The, the young VC were knocked backwards from the minigun rounds driving into them. I could see the red splotches appear on their naked chests. All three went down almost instantly. It all happened so quickly that Oscar did not get off another burst from his M60. Red Six was ecstatic, said I had done great work. About that time, the four Third Squadron AK, ACAVs arrived. The three young VC were unceremoniously dumped in the back of the APCs. The Third Squadron troopers gave us the victory signal, turned around and returned and headed towards Loch Ninn. I didn't like what had happened at all. I felt sick that I had just killed three human beings. Back at Conloy in the operations bunker at the debrief, various people were congratulating me. I didn't feel like that I had done anything that deserved any kind of congratulations. We were heading back to the scout hooch with a small group. Red Six walked up to me, shook my hand, pulled me closer, and whispered in my ear, would have worked better if you'd listened to me to begin with. My platoon leader walked me back to the hooch he knew something was wrong and asked me what it was. I told him pretty directly, today I killed three young human beings. My platoon leader responded quickly and sharply. Look, Porter, we here are in the war business. You made a decision today to capture three dinks instead of killing them on the spot. It was a good idea, but it didn't work out. You had no choice but to do what you did. It was either you or them. He got up to leave and I'll always remember what he said as he walked away into the evening. Remember what Nathan Bedford Forrest said during the Civil War when asked what he thought of warfare. War means fighting and fighting means killing. Next slide, please. With some time and uh, experience, I, I developed uh, something that was akin to a Sixth Sense, I believe, uh, I, could, I, could, I could know when the VC were there. I just had developed some kind of, I, I just knew that. And, and, uh, and this, this uh, excerpt talks about that. It's called, They Are Here. With time and experience, I developed what I believe was a sixth sense concerning finding dicks. I, didn't, I did not think any, it, anything unusual or notable but simply a natural progression of my scouting development. One day we had been working on a box in a box near Loch Ninn. My Oscar in this mission was Pineapple. I considered him the best of the Oscars. We had flown on some difficult missions previously. Despite whispers of a druggy reputation, he was exceptional at finding VC and exceptionally good in the cockpit during the fight. We discovered fresh trails entering a VR box from the south, heading north, towards the border into light jungle. Tellingly, the trails uh, did not exit the box on the other side near the border, indicating the dink was down there somewhere, but where? We worked the box for a complete fuel load, about two hours. My gun was a new guy with whom I had never worked. He was a little jumpy and anxious to move on. I knew there was something in this box, fresh trails do not lie, and I had a growing sense BC were there, but they would not show themselves. I crisscrossed the box at high speed. My eyes felt like they were popping out of their sockets from straining. Pineapple looked as hard as I. He was hanging out the door with his M60 and muttering. Through the jungle, we could see small scraps of sunlight on the ground below, but no VC. My new guy, Krober, was nearing fuel critical and becoming anxious. I told him to relax. Something was in here and we had to find it. They are here, Pineapple, just watching us. I feel it, I said. We kept looking and nothing. Lacking of, lack of fuel was becoming a real problem. But if we broke to get fuel in return, whatever there was probably free to, would flee, flee safely into Cambodia. I had an idea. I told Pineapple, on my word, kick out a smoke. He knew instantly what I was thinking. I called the gun and told him what I was doing. 
and told him to hold fire until required. I was worried that the rookie cobra would not follow my instructions. I circled back to the south, picked up the trail into the jungle, and followed it for at least the tenth time until it disappeared beneath us. I continued on the same azimuth across the jungle until about midway in the box. At this point, I knew they were the VC were directly below us. I could see them in my mind's eye, quietly hunkered down, pointing up to us, to their comrades, and grinning. Kick, I told Pineapple over the intercom. Out went the M18 grenade with a pop. It began falling, streaming red smoke, and the following red billow on top of the jungle, uh, continuing its descent through the treetops into the ground where it blossomed into a bright red cloud. Within an instant, a spray of tracers flew up towards us from the ground. Pineapple fired into the jungle at the base, screaming, Chew on this, you dinks, he said, as he poured M60 rounds into the base of the red smoke. I squeezed the trigger of the minigun, yelled into the radio, taking fire, and banked hard left. The rookie rolled in with rockets and cannon towards the smoke. We zipped to safety. Neither of us had fuel to spare to develop the situation. However, the third squadron were unable to develop a situation because the border was near. Sadly that day, VC escaped. When we returned to the bunker for out brief, my platoon leader was there. The technique of dropping smoke prior to being attacked was slightly unorthodox. And the operations officer was curious and wanted an explanation. Incidentally, I did not get along very well with the, op with the operations officer. When I justified my actions to the operations officer, he seemed some degree impressed. Porter, he said, I don't necessarily agree with what you did today, but it worked this time. February, uh, the last month I flew was, was a really uh, terrible time. Uh, the dinks were more active than ever. Uh, we had lost uh, some pilots and this is called uh, my last flight. Uh, one late afternoon on February 17, I was flying uh, with an experienced pilot on a hunter killer mission requested by the second squadron. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. We were working in a valley about four kilometers south of the border. February had been a bad month. Dink activity was very high. We had lost three pilots recently. In the past four days, each of my hunter killer missions had abruptly ended with taking fire. My pre-mission mindset had changed during those days from what I would do if fired upon to what I, would, what I would do when I was attacked. I was smoking more and enjoying it less. We had been flying since mid-morning over four hours. So far, it had been uneventful. We had about one hour fuel left and shifted our last mission, the last scheduled VR box, further to the west and nearer the border. Near the center of the new box lay a deep valley, about a thousand meters in length, which ran generally north-south with a peaceful stream meandering through its midsection. The northern part of the valley began a little south of the border and was beginning to be shadowed this time of day as we started our low-level recon in the south working to the north. I immediately had, had an awareness something unusual was here, but it was very thick jungle and we could see little on the ground. What I could see was crisscrossed with several fresh trails which heightened our anticipation. In fact, there were more trails in one spot than I can ever remember seeing. That promptly raised the ante. When I reported this fact of the number of trails to my gun, he immediately sounded a little nervous. About a third of the way up the valley near the center, suddenly the trees below exploded with tracers directly in front of me. I banked sharply right and screamed, taking fire on the radio. Oscar kicks red smoke out, marking the location of the VC on the ground and blazed away with his M60. The gunship rolled in instantly and I fled south away from danger. The gun and I climbed to altitude and headed back to Cornwall. We both needed fuel. En route, the gun reported to the second squadron what we had seen. By monitoring second squadron over the FM radios, we learned some of the action we just left behind was continuing. Surprisingly, the Thunder Horse operations officer now arrived on station, flying a 2,000 feet orbit over the valley in a Huey communicating with the second squadron operations. 
He had called in additional Thunder Horse Cobras and was directing the rotary wing air combat over the valley. It was unusual for him to leave his operations bunker, but there he was. During the 30 minute flight back to Quan Loy, the operations officer asked us to return to the valley after we refueled and rearmed. In case a second look was required, he said in his overbearing way. Second look was also unusual. Oscar and I joked over the intercom that one look at that place was enough. After refuel and rearm at Conroy, we returned and reported to the operations officer that we were on station. He directed us to stay out of the way to the west. It was clear based on the number of aircraft, dust mixed with smoke on the ground and fireball explosions we could see in the distance that something out of the ordinary was going on in the valley. After 15 or 20 minutes, the, officer, the operations officer called and said it was going well and we probably would not be needed. I was sure we would not, he would not need us. The dinks were located. We had marked the position. Our work was done. As time passed, we could monitor the conversations on our radios and see Thunder Horse Cobras rolling in, daisy chain fashion, one after another with their 2.75 inch rockets impacting in the middle of the valley along with artillery erupting in the shadows. Thac had entered the conversation. That was a very good thing. The second squadron was in the vicinity approaching the western edge of the valley. The dust from their track vehicles was evident. Their troops reported the ground fire was pretty intense. Our operations officer was, con was continuing to talk with the second squadron, which appeared now to be deep into the action. I heard the operations officer respond to someone by saying, we'll take another look. I was wondering just how he was gonna do that when he called the gun and I. Second Squadron thinks we have discovered a considerable enemy force, he said. They request a quick recon on the northwestern ridge of the valley near the shadows to see what is there. Zip in there again and see what you can see. I looked at Oscar, he didn't want to do it and neither did I. I called the operations officer back. Look, we found the dinks and marked the spot earlier and we will surely find them again. What will this add to the tactical picture? He responded in his whiny way, this time talking directly to me. White 1-9, what second squadron is reporting is a little north of your original mark and what you find will help a great deal with second squadron's orientation on the dink. I did not immediately respond. My personal dislike for him, as well as the fact this guy was rarely in any combat, and now he was directing me into peril, gave me some pause. Okay, I answered. There is no need for the gunship to cover me. I'm going to go in very fast, and when I draw fire, we'll mark the spot and be gone as fast as we went in. I believe he could read my displeasure and answer quickly in a more friendly tone. Roger White 19, that's all I need, just a good mark, and please, please be careful. We flew to the west at altitude and dropped down to low level, well west of the valley. Frankly, I was really scared, probably more frightened than ever before. In most fights, enemy contact is a surprise. This time we were going into the valley in which we just had had NBA contact. I was reasonably certain it would happen again. That is an indescribable feeling of helplessness. I told Oscar, do not hesitate to kick smoke and begin firing when you see anything resembling a dink. Oscar nodded. I wanted to make a good run, a good as market as possible for the second squadron, but I did not want to die. Oscar was pale and looked worried. His jaw was set. I was literally shaken. There was no question in my mind that there were VC in those shadows in the northern part of the valley where we were directed to go. My plan was to take about the same route into the valley as the first time, but much faster and lower this time with a break to the left over the shadowed ridge in question. In we went. I was flying well over 100 knots. The LOH was really vibrating because of the excessive speed. As we entered the mouth of the valley, I could see the approaching dark shadows at the far end of the walls of the narrow valley closing in on us. As we neared the north end short of the shadows, I broke sharply left, started climbing up the walls of the valley, zigging and zagging towards the top of the ridge. The loach was really vibrating now. 
I glanced downward over the tops of my boots through the bubble into the brakes and the jungle roof. There were several NBA and black uniforms climbing up the side of the valley to the ridge on the west side of the valley. There appeared to be dead and a few wounded scattered on the ground. Almost immediately, we saw tracers flashing up all around the front of the OH-6. Simultaneously, I reported taking fire, fired the minigun, sending tracers into the NBA. Oscar kicked the red smoke out and was already firing as I broke left away from the fire. Our smoke began billowing up from the, beneath the trees. The operation officer shouted, great job, white one night, as we raced to the way of west and safety. He sounded relieved as I reported what we'd seen. On the radio, we heard the operations officer report to the second squadron of the NBA sighting, and there was an accurate smoke mark on the target. The second squadron commander immediately began firing artillery onto the shadows and the ridge and the mark. Thunder Horse Cobras hammered the area with rockets into the red smoke. I flew back up to 1,500 feet, picked up my gunship, and started the flight back to Cornwall. I was drenched in sweat. I told Oscar, we're done. You did good. He looked relieved. I could hear the operations officer acknowledge to someone, second squadron was being held short of moving to the ridge, awaiting reinforcements. Awaiting reinforcements meant there were probably more VC than expected. Uh, it looked more and more like this was a larger NVA force than anyone bargained for. My troop commander, Thunder Horse 6, now arrived on station and took over the rotary wing air combat operation and the operations officer returned to Pawn Loy and his bunker. At this point, a new voice became dormant part of a dominant part of the radio dialogue. This voice was deeper and sounded like real authority. I learned later the new voice was the regimental commander, Black Horse Six himself, flying in his command and control Huey. He had learned of the contact, flew to the area, joined the radio net, and began issuing instructions to everyone. Incidentally, 11 years later, he would be a four-star SYNC Redcom, and I was his aide. Oscar and I were certain we were done with the mission. We were happy we had survived, and we felt good that we could give the second squadron a good mark. Suddenly, the troop commander called me and asked me to return to the area after refuel and rearm. I need you back here as soon as possible. No explanation, just return. I really was not alarmed and thought it was probably just for me to provide some background for what I had seen. He'd just taken over the operation and no doubt needed that. Oscar tapped me on the arm. I'm not gonna go back in there. I said confidently, look, we are done. We're not gonna go back in. But I was a little worried about Oscar. What if we did go back in again? But if you think you need a break, okay, I said. I called operations, told them, to get me a new Oscar and ask specifically for pineapple. We landed at Quan Loy and hovered to the refuel pad, then to Thunder Horse Pad. There waiting was the platoon leader, pineapple, maintenance folks, and other pilots and crew chiefs who had been listening via operations external speakers. There was not the usual banter, no laughing, no joking, no gallows humor. This was serious. As Oscar exited the loach, pineapple leaned over and said something to him which caused Oscar to blanch. I always wondered what Pineapple said. My platoon leader sauntered up to the aircraft in his low key way and said, well, Porter, you're in it again. He then asked me more seriously if I wanted to be replaced. I declined, told him surely the troop commander wanted me back only to provide firsthand information on site. The ground maintenance guys were going over my OH-6 with a fine toothed comb. The troop aviation maintenance warrant officer stuffed a fresh pack of Winston in my chicken plate pocket. There was no damage to the OH-6. Pineapple added additional 7.62 minigun ammo while I checked the gun. Sometimes miniguns jam if used a lot. We'd use this one a lot. The gun looked fine. Pineapple had been monitoring the fight from operations. He looked unusually grim and as usual said nothing. As we departed and began picking up snippets of radio traffic from the valley, we get, as we gained altitude, snatches of the deep voice from regiment talking to another deeper voice who had dropped down on our, our net. It was his boss, the commander of the 1st Cavalry Division. We heard the following quote, 
large NVA force moving north across our sector, headed towards the border, moving a squadron plus to react to the NVA, request additional air support and artillery. The deep voice from regiment then began talking to our, the Air Cav Troop Commander, our, our leader. Black Horse 6 was very complimentary about the Thunder Horse performance that day. He told the troop commander his NVA force, this NVA force, appeared to be part of the division force we'd often been briefed about, apparently headed back into Cambodia after fighting in the south. He told my commander to stand by. Uh, as we arrived, we could see the valley below. Activity had at least quadrupled since our first look an hour or so earlier. Shadows in the north had lengthened, lengthened. About half the valley was now covered in shadows. FAC was having a field day with Air Force bombers. Artillery was impacting in the northern part of the valley. Inside the black shadows were huge churning red eruptions laced with swirling black stripes from artillery and Air Force aircraft ordnance. It looked like a cauldron from hell. We could see the expanded dust cloud that the 2nd Squadron's armored forces were still approaching ridges along the valley from the west. I reported to the troop commander we were on station and flew to the west well out of the way. Do you still have a scout on station? The deep regimental voice asked Thunder Horse 6. My commander at answered that the scout who started this contact is standing by. I need him to confirm there are dinks now moving up the east of uh, the ridge on the east side of the valley. Thunder Horse 6 immediately responded. This scout has marked targets in the valley twice in the past hour. He reported 30 minutes ago that NVA were flowing up the ridge in the west. I doubt anything has changed much. The deep regimental voice paused then said, I wanna move the third squadron to flank where we think the dinks are in the east. Second squadron is moving in the western edge of the valley. Your scout's mark will have a huge impact on the way I direct the 3rd Squadron in the east. An accurate mark in that part of the valley would take much of the guesswork out of what I'm trying to do. Sure enough, we can now see dust clouds of the armored vehicles of 3rd Squadron approaching the east, eastern part of the valley. The regimental commander's plan meant a large portion of the entire regiment was in position to attack these returning NVA. The troop commander asked me, did you monitor that? I did and understood, but it was a real why me moment. This makes no sense, I answered back. Troop commander, uh, the troop commander responded quickly. Roger White 19, you do not have to go back in. I will get another scout. You have done more than is necessary. I knew that would take 45 minutes to get another scout crew on station. By that time, much could change and we could lose this opportunity. I turned and looked at Pineapple with the unspoken question. He was stoic, looking straight ahead. He said almost robotically, you're the boss. Looking down in the valley, there was really no option. I had to do it a third, I had to do a third recon. I called Thunder Horse 6, told him we would go in again. A few minutes later, my commander called. White 19, you are clear to begin your run. This mark is very important, but please don't take any unnecessary risk. I decided the route I would take would be much similar to earlier routes. I was sure not gonna surprise any dinks this time. My mission was to confirm VC were still moving up the valley, this time on the eastern wall of the valley and mark that spot. It appeared best for me to sweep over them from the rear, at least their weapons would not be initially pointed my way. I dropped out of the sky through the dead man zone. I was absolutely terrified and I was physically shaking again. I could barely fly and thought of Susie, my wife. I had always been pretty confident of what I was doing, but as I went into the valley this time, I knew for the first time in my life, my chances of survival were really in question. I had never been in such a situation in which I expected the worst. That is a hard realization to arrive at. As earlier, I flew as fast as possible, zigging and zagging. As we entered the mouth of the valley heading north, the dark shadows were now on us. It was physically cooler in the gloom. It felt oppressive, cool, and heavy. As we started the run up the valley, I glanced to my left at one of the bravest men I ever knew. He appeared anxious, but resolute. His features were frozen. There were beads of sweat on his right cheek. My mouth was dry, my hands were clenched around the flight controls and the minigun trigger. For some reason, 
This time I gritted my teeth and braced myself for impact as if I was gonna crash. Strangely, I remember gunfighters scouting theory of inevitability. Was it coming true? Suddenly above all the chaos that is combat, vibration, explosions, radios blaring, and general mayhem, I heard a crystal clear male voice repeating over and over the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. With that voice and those words, I knew in my soul this would be okay. I just unexplainably knew it. I became instantly calm and clear-headed. All the earlier fears vanished. This time we flew further up the valley than before in order to parallel the eastern crest, banked hard right, and began climbing up the eastern wall of the valley. As earlier, the jungle seemed to erupt tracers beneath me. We could see again brief snatches of the NVA in black uniforms, some firing back at us like black ants, ants flowing up the side of an anthill. My minigun was shrieking, pineapple kicked the red smoke and was hanging out the door, pouring M60 7.62 rounds into the ants and the face of the dink tracers flying uh, towards us from below. A red smoke billowed up from the ground, creating a much sought after mark, the much sought after mark, and we were gone like the wind. As we departed, we felt the concussion of huge explosions from FAC jets dropping bombs in the valley immediately behind us. Artillery was banging along the ridges. As we gained altitude, I asked Pineapple if he was okay. I've never seen so many dinks, he said quietly, shaking his head. The next day, I went to the operations bunker before the morning briefing. I was interested in how yesterday's operation ended. As I walked in, the operations officer was busy updating his situation map. As it turned out, 11th Cavalry intercepted a regimental plus size NVA unit, which was returning to Cambodia from operations in the South. There were many NVA captured and killed. Overall, it was a good day to be in the Black Horse. As I walked out of operations past the situation map, the operations officer had updated the map with yesterday's fight. It had been a significant operation and he was giving the ground where it happened a name to add to the others from previous Thunder Horse combat. On the troop situation map, at the precise spot on the map, that dark valley with a peaceful stream, which ran out of Cambodia and in which so much fighting and dying had occurred less than 24 hours earlier, the operations officer had written with his indelible black pen in bold letters, Valley, of the shadows. Uh, the next day I was, I left the scout platoon and became the troop uh, XO. The, uh, the next gigantic event of course was the, was the one May inv invasion into Cambodia. Unfortunately, I, I, was, I was a logistician by then and I didn't, have, there was no combat at all that I was involved in. I did spend two nights in uh, Schnoll, Cambodia though. Around 1 June, this, the regiment came out of, uh, out of Cambodia, went well south to a new base camp, a place called Xi'an, uh, which had been the 1st Infantry Division base camp. It was, a, it was very nice. It was uh, uh, brick and mortar structures, sidewalk, paved roads, and running water, first time. So... Uh, two, days, two days prior to de-roasting, I, uh, I made captain. There was a party that evening. Next slide, please. And uh, I, so after the party, I walked back to my hooch and I walked past the troop headquarters and we had a, leaning up against the wall in the troop headquarters, we had a five by five plywood, whitewashed board that had stenciled on the top, gone but not forgotten, gone but not forgotten. And on that board were stapled or glued or tacked, whatever, the name tapes of all the pilots and observers that had been in the air cab troops since, since the troop came to Vietnam, I think in 66. So I looked at the names uh, on the board. On the top there were names of guys who had come and gone and I, I didn't know them. But as I got down towards the middle and the bottom, I knew all those men. And there were, uh, some of those tapes were muddied, some were scorched, some were had blood on them. 
and, and there were 12 of those who were killed when I was there. That's a lot, but there were 12. Um, and as I thought about that, it, it, it just it dawned on me that the best, the best part of, of the whole 365 days was being with these men and living with them and, and working with them and, and crying with them and uh, just being a part of that. So, so I reached into my pocket and pulled out my knife and uh, cut my name tape off and dropped it in, the, uh, in front of the Gone But Not Forgotten board. It was over. It was over. Next slide, please. If anybody, let me uh, unmute myself. If anybody has questions, please use the question and answer icon. Okay. First question is uh, Shannon from Shannon. And she wants to know, did, did gunfighters survive the war? He did. He did. He, uh, he went, he, he, uh, he was horribly wounded, uh, was, was uh, recouped for two years, I think. Uh, went back to University of Virginia, uh, got a law degree and died, I think, two years ago in Salem, Virginia, surrounded by his wife and two kids. And I would have never dreamt that that would happen to gunfighter, but it did. I'm very glad of that, very happy. Somebody wants to just say, uh, Lee wants to say a magnificent presentation. Uh, Carl, I uh, want to know, did you hear the results of your third trip in the Valley? Did, reg uh, did the regimental commander use the info you gathered? Uh, he did. Although I'm getting, the information I gathered was a spot, you know, I just dropped, I dropped a, uh, a smoke grenade in the center of mass where I thought the enemy was. And of course, that's driven by ground fire that you're receiving. So we popped smoke uh, and, and uh, I, I assume it, it turned out to be, as I said, a good day to be in the Black Horse. So he was uh, apparently able to use that information to, uh, to do what he intended to do with, with Third Squadron. And, uh, it, it uh, he, that particular regimental commander was uh, involved in a lot of fights. I was one of many he was involved in, but uh, that was kind of his, uh, he, he was very good at, at fighting the regiment uh, in mass. Uh, we have a question from John, but I got to ask for clarification. John, could you confirm RF slash PF? I would say regular forces, partisan forces, but uh, I'm not sure what your acronym means. Do you know, Dave? I do. I uh, do not. Do not. John, could you highlight and set it, submit it again, please? Um, maintenance of the aircraft. Could you discuss uh, issues on maintenance of the aircraft in the environment you were you were operating in? It was. Uh, we were. It, it was very very good. We had. Uh, I think probably in co in that si in combat situation. You, you always have more than than in a, a Fort Carson, Colorado, and so we had a we had a bunch of maintenance guys. We had a, that maintenance warrant I spoke of earlier was a superb guy, and and we just uh, maintenance. I cannot remember maintenance ever being diff, a, a problem. We and, and same with avionics and in, in, in um, aviation, avionics are important, and we had an avionics shop that just kept everything up, and so. I don't, I don't recall ever uh, any kind of maintenance issues, particularly with the OH-6, which I was very familiar with, or the Huey, which I, which I flew for three months or so. Uh, yeah, it's uh, regional forces and popular forces. Did you, uh, your unit work with them at all? RFP, uh, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so, Michael. I don't remember... Uh, I remember the term, but I, I don't know. I think I probably picked it up later. I, I don't think we did. Okay. Well, now, yeah, I got a couple of people saying, reminding me what RF and, and, and PS stood for. Um, 
So if maintenance was an issue, what, what was the big issue that the, uh, the squadron did face? You mean the troop? Troop, yes. Um, we, we, uh, we were ill. The whole troop got sick for about three days because of some food we ate. Uh, that was one problem. We, we were uh, in February. We, uh, as I indicated, we were down pilots and, and they didn't, they were backfilled very quickly. And so we, uh, we were flying a lot. And, and, uh, and that was a problem across the board in the troop. Um, but I, we didn't have a lot of, uh, we didn't have a lot of showstoppers. It, it, it uh, good leadership and good anticipation everywhere. And it just, it worked very well. Um, this question's from, uh, looks like Marcy. Did your relationship with your operations officer who initially you didn't like improve at all? It did much better. Uh, it, it, uh, in the book, I talk about, uh, when I'm, Subsequently assigned to back to 11th Cav in Germany in Fulda, he was the uh, he was the he was a, an operations officer. We became good friends, and uh, and uh, he passed away a few years ago. But we we were very good friends. Okay. Um, I'll ask another question. What did you carry back to your units when you left Vietnam? What was your next assignment? Did you carry back your lessons, or did you use your lessons later on during your career? Uh, my next assignment was at Fort Walters, Texas. I went back to flight school. I was an instructor, first uh, on the brief land flight line, and then, and then a platform instructor. Um, so, so yeah, we, we uh, and that was the primary aviation then had two flight schools, one at Fort Walters, Texas, which was the first six months, and then at Fort Rucker. And it was the primary flight training center something or other at Fort Walters, which is where I was. And uh, I th the, the platform structure instruction was extraordinary. Uh, we had guys who had done all this stuff and they, we talked to the new guys and the new pilots and so forth. And so uh, I thought the instruction was superb and I'm sure the flight line training was, was the same because you got guys coming directly back from Vietnam who were, who were doing flight training. And uh, so I, I think it was probably a real high, high quality training going on there. And the same at Fort Rucker. Six months later, guys would go to Fort Rucker as students. And it was the same environment. The, the uh, pilots and, and real live officers, as we call ourselves, were there in, in mass, a lot of experience. And so in the, in the aviation world, at least, it was, uh, it was a lot of uh, high quality training going on. Uh, this question comes from Ed, and I'll start explaining. He wanted to know if you uh, suffered M any. You said you had twelve uh, members die while you were there. Yeah. Did any of them become MIAs or POWs, or did you find them all? Found them all. Found them all. Okay. And it happened. It's interesting. It happened in probably six or seven of them happened uh, early in February. You know, it goes in. If you look at that it, deaths in combat. Of course, the enemy always has a vote, but it, 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 they seem to always happen in mass. And in this case, we had, we had a helicopter, a, a Cobra fly into a FAC up, up in altitude and, and a couple other similar instances within two or three days. And that, that's seven guys, bang, all gone quickly. Was that a, a certain uh, period during their uh, stay in Vietnam that it occurred early, middle or late? It was, it, in my case, it was early in February. February was a black month, as I, as I said. Okay. A lot of terrible things were happening in February. Uh, this is a question from Josh. Did you serve with any Oscar 19 Deltas later in your career? Oscar 19 Deltas. I guess it's an MOS. Yeah, 19 Deltas is a scout. Yep. Oh. Um, uh, not that I know of. The, these guys that were flying, um, our 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 uh, our Oscars were were as I in the book I talk about their 19 deltas and they were exceptional exceptional guys and they they were all 19 delta trained at Fort Knox and somewhere in the book I say the only difference between those guys and the 19 deltas in the tracks out in the bush 
where these guys were plying their trade in the in the uh, seat of an OH6 rather than in a uh, in a in an A cab or a Sheridan or a tank. Uh, same, almost identical, same training, and they were very very good guys. Every one of them, I really really admired. Um, were your losses during the uh, during the period there were they largely due to enemy fire or were there some maintenance losses? No maintenance losses. Um, we had a, we had uh, we had one Huey that he landed okay, so it wasn't a loss. He had a, he had a, uh, a a problem with his flight control, but landed it and, and got it down okay. So uh, I, I I cannot recall any uh, any maintenance or losses at all. It was all all combat loss, and combat loss was just another strange deal. If something got shot down out the bush, you had to go recover it or at least recover the data plate off of it. And so that, that was high adventure also. The next question is one that uh, I uh, have to smile at because one of my last flights when I was with the 25th, uh, one of the master warrants was going to fly for us. We were still on Hueys. And, uh, you know, the Black Hawk at that time was flying fast and low. <laughs> he, he turned to me and said, sir, can I fly like I used to? <laughs> I just had to say, Chief, don't kill us. Uh, because he, he went back into, you know, uh, flying map of the earth and bouncing up the gullies and, and running yeah. through trees. In Hawaii? Uh, did you have to unlearn anything when you went back to teach a flight school? Or were you able to use all the lessons you learned in Vietnam? Uh, I think some, I, we were talked to about that. Um, yeah, you do. And, and, and uh, frankly, in combat, you do what you have to do, and and, uh, and I've talked to pilots in different parts of Vietnam. Uh, we, I was never, I never felt constricted in firing my weapon. Never, never. If if I needed to fire it, I fired it, and and we, God knows we did enough of that. But there were other places in Vietnam in which uh, there were there were constraints. You, you just couldn't do that, and so. Uh, I, I was uh, I, I felt very fortunate in that regard. We didn't we weren't we were not handcuffed at all uh, in any in any kind of uh, strictures as concerns firing our weapons. Not at all. Last question: Start and end date of your your tour. Twenty three July, twenty four July, uh, sixty nine seventy. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap it up. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to make? No, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I know this uh, this is a little different than what you normally do, Mike. But it, I think it, I'm glad you had you uh, you brought it up and uh, well and I really enjoyed it. We we do like the full gamut. We we, we we've had others that uh, that gave very personal experiences, and and oh, it does yeah. add it does add uh, uh, to the story that we're trying to preserve and uh, the story that we're trying to protect. And this is all covered in your book, correct? Uh, yeah, the book is, uh, right, it covers, there are several other, uh, several other events, should we say, in, in the book, and, uh, and uh, so yeah, it, it's all in the book. Everybody. Okay, and the name of the book and where they can get it? It's called <laughs> Making Fire. <laughs> yeah, I don't uh, let you plug the book. No, oh, no, I don't, I, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's called Taking Fire, Memoir of an Aerial Scout in Vietnam. And it's, uh, I think, probably the best place to go get it is Amazon. Okay. That's, that's the quickest way. Well, thank you much. Um, yeah. I do want to say that for the folks who, who are here tonight, please let folks know that next week we're going to go back to World War I. Uh, we always talk about the Navajo uh, Code Talkers during World War II, but next uh, week's presentation on the 4th, of May at 7 p.m. is the first Code Talkers, Native American Communicators in World War I with Professor William Meadows. So I invite you back next week uh, to hear about an earlier use of uh, some of our Native American soldiers. So again, Dave, thanks for coming here tonight. We'll get your presentation up on the web here in the next day or so, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Okay.